how are you doing? Very good. It's a beautiful day out there. Is it hot today? Um, hot enough. It's certainly beach weather out there. We've been, it's been raining uh -huh. for the past few weeks and it's nice to have a sun out. Mm -hmm. You're in South, you're in Charleston, South Carolina, right? That's correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, are you a native South Carolinian, John? I am not. I moved down here in 2001 from Canada. Oh, you're, are you Canadian? Uh, technically, I'm both. Uh, my, oh, wow. Both my parents were born in Canada. My, my mother was born in California. My father um, uh, born in Montana. Long story. Uh, but um, I'm technically, I'm both, but I can't have both. I can only have one or the other. Uh, although I'm told I could apply for a Canadian passport, but yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, uh, we've been Facebook friends for a while for like Since 10 years or something. Days, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so I would love to get your, um, perspective on this election, John. Okay. Um, I mean, being that you're in the South. Yeah. And South Carolina is such an important state this year because of the Senate race. Yes. That seems to be close. It's our chance to rid ourselves of Lindsey Graham and get a really good person, Jamie Harrison, um, in the Senate. Yeah. Right. Yeah. African-American progressive into the Senate. Um, so what is that like right now? Like, I know that um, you're like Charleston is pretty much a more progressive democratic place kind of surrounded by a sea of red. Um, That's correct. So, yes. Yeah. So what does it feel like right now? Are people talking about the election? What's going on? Um, with COVID it kind of makes it difficult because um, I, I don't go out to the places like downtown Charleston or um, to I'd say folly because there's just so many people and you know um but from the feeling i'm getting is it feels to me like uh, people have made up their minds one way or another um it um i'll i'll just clarify that like say if if they have already made up their mind that they're voting for trump uh boy have they um, um, to the point of, uh, um, I, I have a, a couple friends who are, who are telling me, uh, voting for Biden will be the single biggest mistake that you'll ever make. Uh, likewise with, uh, the, uh, my friends who are Biden supporters are saying exactly the same thing where one vote for Trump will be the single biggest mistake you'll ever make. And unfortunately, this is where we're at. Um, and I do have a couple of friends who are, are voting for the Libertarians. I forgot what their candidate was. Um, uh, and for me personally, it's like I've already made up my mind where I'm going, going to vote. And So tell, it, tell me about that. Like what, when did you make up your mind and who are you voting for? Uh, well, I made up my mind, um, first of all, after the, um, uh, the Democratic event, or when the Democratic Party held their event here, um, mm -hmm. uh, this is like at the beginning, and um, I was, I was at, at that point, I was like, let's get someone in there other than Trump, and then I had mm -hmm. to feel around, you know, who mm -hmm. I believed in, uh, Kamala was one of them, and um, so was uh, Andrew Yang. Andrew Yang loved mm -hmm. met Andrew Yang math, and um, but but you're a Democrat, right? So I'm an I. I'm an independent. Uh, when oh, okay. I um, uh, I signed up as an independent back in 2002. Uh, this was during the time when it was between George um, W. Bush mm -hmm. and John Kerry, was it? 
<laughs> and I, I couldn't be sold either way. And I went for the Green Party. Um, I went, mm -hmm. I voted solid Green Party up until uh, Obama. Then I went uh, voted for Obama. Um, and then so you voted for Obama in 08 and 12? Correct. And correct. then you, yes. did you vote for Hillary in 16? Uh, 16, yes. Uh, in fact, I went full Bernie because uh, it felt like an echo of um, the political landscape in Saskatchewan for me. That's where I grew up. That's where we had Tommy Douglas, the birth of the NDP. And then Bernie Sanders for me was an echo of that. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, uh, I was supporting to, uh, him in two, 2016. And then when Hillary uh, got the ticket, I was thinking, okay, Hillary. Okay. Um, so did you think about voting for Green Party in 2016? No, no. Mm -hmm. um, I was, uh, uh, by that time, the days of, um, uh, who am I thinking of? Um, was it Jill? Who was part Jill of Stein. Jill Stein, Jill yeah. Jill Stein. Mm -hmm. I figured um, right in, uh, at that time, I wasn't feeling her as much as I was feeling for Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so this year, um, Joe Biden wasn't your first choice, but you're you're going to vote for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, right? No. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, and you're you're not tempted to vote Green Party. Uh, it, this year, it feels far too important. Uh, for me to show my support for the Democratic Party. Um, that's how I'm genuinely feeling right now, that um, um, it's, it's different now than what it was back in 2002, 2004, certainly. Um, where I so, so tell me like, what you think the stakes are in this election. Like, why is this election so important to you? Uh, well, several things, um, none of which I would have expected to happen. The, um, the first thing was the you know, uh, United States Postal Service. I never thought that would ever be in play. And for me, that was important. Um, and uh, the mishandling of the COVID crisis I don't know what anybody else thinks, but 1,000, no, what, 180,000 dead Americans means more important, is more important to me than being a statistic. I mean, those are real people whose lives have perished in this uh, horrific virus. And uh, um, sorry, but Trump mishandled the whole thing from day one. Mm -hmm. That's important to me. Um, and then, um, it's, uh, it, it feels like we're taking two steps back, right. um, you know, pulling ourselves away from the world stage, pulling ourselves away from right. trade and so forth, uh, isolating ourselves. It's like, isn't this what, uh, um, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Seuss had warned us about, uh, all the way back when he, you know, did all these cartoons about, you know, <laughs> isolating ourselves during World War II of all right. things. So, but you've never been a Trump fan, right? No, no. <laughs> um, so this, this is bef even before COVID, even, even before, before the post of, so, I mean, you had problems with him from the beginning, right? Um, yes. Uh, and the RNC this past week, I, I paid attention to none of it. I, I got um, mm -hmm. you know the tidbits from from NPR, love mm -hmm. NPR by the way, uh, and that felt to me like the RNC was a hero show. show excuse me, day one, the Democrats are evil. Day two, uh, mm -hmm. Trump is the hero. He's going to save a day. Uh, save a day. And the rest of the week, here's how he's going to do it, and this is why he's our man. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. um, it's 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 like a um, made-for-TV special, and uh, it's like, 
what is this? You know? Well, right. Um, okay, so, but I mean, from what I know about you, I mean, you had um, very serious problems with Trump going back to 2016 election, right? Yeah. Yes. I okay. Did. So can, can we talk about that? Like, what are some issues you had with Trump back then? Oh, where do we start? Um, we, we can all go all the way back to when he uh, made the, um, uh, the gesture um, with that. Uh, I forgot what it was now. Was it the New York Times or the Washington Post reporter who has cerebral palsy or something like that? New York Times. Uh-huh. New York, thank you. New York Times. Uh, and that too, where he was just bashing in media and um, just uh, downplaying any kind of scientific or medical authority or mm -hmm. any kind of authority. He seems to be just, you know, right. uh, not logic and knowledge. What's that? Uh, forget that. Let's just go with, with what's on the whim, you know. I don't understand that. Uh -huh. So, I mean, can you think of a word that best describes Trump to you? Anti-Reagan. Mm -hmm. Anti-Reagan. It's like everything that, uh, that Ronald Reagan has set up, Trump just destroyed all that. Are you, were you a Reagan supporter? Uh, not as much. Um, I, 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 I wasn't, and then it's, uh, I'm going to look at some of the things that, you know, Reagan had stood for, mm -hmm. compared that with what Trump stands for. And it's like, this is not the same Republican party. What happened? Mm -hmm. So what do you think happened? Um, I'm not, I honestly, I'm not sure because it, it went from being a, a party of conservative values and, cons, uh, you know, what people stood for as being conservative, mm -hmm. conservative to being mm -hmm. Trump's party. Mm -hmm. How did it go from we to him? Mm -hmm. Right. I don't understand that transition and, and mm -hmm. that bothers me, honestly. It's mm -hmm. like a party of values to a party of one single person. Right. Well, I think some people might say they've never really saw the Republican Party really as a party of values, mm. you know, and, and I personally know a lot of people who are very critical of Reagan. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. Um, although among Republicans, Reagan is still considered um, a big hero. And they are really offended in just what you just said, like offended that Trump has really destroyed the Republican Party from within. Yeah. Um, I guess um, the, the question that I have um, that we both share is like we're both frustrated by the, our inability to engage productively in conversations with people about yeah. the election, about politics, um, whether you call it brainwashing, cultish behavior, or um, people who yeah. fall down a rabbit hole, or people who are just ignorant. Like there are just a, a variety of ways to describe it, but the end result is it's very difficult to have productive conversations. It really is because it's like people have already made up their minds before you ask them anything about anything. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, you talk, you know, you approach a Trump supporter about Biden, and they already made up his mind that he's a He's a what? He's a pedophile. He's he's um, far too old for his job. He's 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 lost his mind. And I'm thinking there's a three or four year difference between Trump and Biden. What are you talking about? You know, mm -hmm. um, and um, I never bought the whole pedophile thing because it just that just seems to be born out of uh, the whole QAnon or HN or wherever the hell that comes from. Um, it's like this is no longer politics. This is, this is, uh, yeah, it feels like people are trying to make us crazy. 
like it 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 makes us feel like we don't really know how to have a connection to reality when it's there's so much of it happening. You know, uh, this past week I thought of a um, there's there's this I guess allegory that that um, I seem to connect with when it comes to not just you know, not on a Trump side, Biden side, but in general the society that we become is. Uh, the Humpty Dumpty syndrome. Are you familiar with Lewis Carroll? Mm-hmm. Okay. Do you remember, remember when Allison and um, Humpty Dumpty were talking? And then Humpty Dumpty said, when I um, use a word, it is what I choose it to mean, no more or less. Mm-hmm. And um, so perhaps we are living in a society of Humpty Dumpty's sitting on the walls, you know, mm-hmm. these fragile beings who, when they fall, they break and um, throwing words mm-hmm. around where, for example, communism, where it seems to have lost all its meaning to where it just means if we don't like it, it must be communism. It's, it's like, mm-hmm. that's not what that word means. But once again, Humpty Dumpty, Mm-hmm. No, it is what I choose it to mean. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's apt. Um, I mean, I feel frustrated that, um, you know, we really have no place where we can even really hear real conversations among fellow Americans. And that's one reason why I'm doing these on Facebook yeah. is I want I want to have conversation, real conversations where we can um, listen to each other and think together and learn together. And it isn't about telling people what to do or think. It's not about punditry. Um, It's really just about Americans like putting our heads together to figure out a way forward. And I feel that is really the spirit of democracy that I believe in, you know, Mm -hmm. that democracy is about people coming together to make decisions. It's about people making decisions and figuring out how we're going to govern. It's not just for the elite. It's not just for the powerful or the pundits, but it's for all of us, you know? And so that's why I feel strongly about having these conversations and, and, and they're not, you know, usually they go on for like, you know, sometimes hour uh, or more Mm -hmm. because it takes time to get to know each other and to um, present ideas and listen and so on. So anyway, so, I mean, having said all that, um, I feel like because I'm not really seeing these conversations take place in many places, I, I'm, I'm choosing to do it. And I've learned a lot already about what people think from around the country. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that, um, I mean, I love South Carolina. I've spent a lot of time there, like documenting, like you know, the massacre. I remember when, when you were yeah. here during uh, mm-hmm. when was it that mm-hmm. shooter a few years right. ago? Right, the yeah, ex mother this? Emanuel. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So I think that um, what I found in South Carolina, and again, a lot of a lot of people don't probably know this about the South, is that some of the best conversations about race take place in the South because people um, are confronted by it. It's not something you can just politely avoid, you know? And, and so some of the best conversations about race and history Mm -hmm. take, take place in the South and, you know, and questions about race quickly would move from, what happened in this instance to the history of our country? What happened during Jim Crow? What happened in the 60s? What happened during slavery? What happened? So, and so it's, it's, there's just a very clear understanding of how, how the present is shaped by the past, you know, and the need to figure out um, how to you know, just reconcile some of these things so we can have a shared future. But when those conversations go wrong and you, you feel like you're in completely different realities, completely different histories, completely different stories, then that's uh, when you just feel hopeless. 
right? I have to agree. In fact, um, I'll, I'll make the case there for uh, with uh, with Dylan Roof. When he committed that tragic act, I remember, um, you know, this happened on the heels of the, uh, was it shootings in, in Baltimore and so forth when. Yeah, Freddie Eric, Gray. Yeah. Everything mm-hmm. just went into a riot. And then I guess some people were expecting Charleston to, to go into a riot. And then we surprised everybody when we mm-hmm. went into prayer. Mm-hmm. What happened yes. between that? Mm-hmm. And this year, mm-hmm. what happened? Uh, I mean, um, all due respect to you know the, the people who were uh, shot and killed by the police, but still that was out of state, and the reaction was totally different than than with uh, with, with Dylan Roof. It's like, what happened in my city? It's it's kind of distressing. Wait, I I'm guess- sorry. What happened? What what are you, I'm not sure if I understand what you're referring to. What happened in Charleston that recently? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, uh, there's uh, there's uh, you know we had the riot downtown. There was looting. I saw you know uh, pictures or not pictures. I, I even uh, you know went through downtown and there you know there was graffiti. There was broken windows. Uh-huh. You're talking about after George Floyd, there yes. were lootings during the protests. Okay, That's right. I yes. understand. That's right. Okay. Yes. And so that reaction was completely different than the reaction from Dylan Roof. And it's like, what on earth happened to my city? Right. Well, I, I think that's a good question. I, I, I think people just feel fed up in a way that um, they never fed, felt so fed up. And also I think the pandemic fed into the sense of frustration Mm-hmm. and anger. I'm not making excuses for people behaving uh, violently. I am against any form of violence. Um, but having said that, um, I think people were ready to explode already from Sally, I think all I the, agree. Yeah, yeah. All the incompetence that we saw uh, with the handling of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And on top of all that, this man dying and making us feel like our lives are in danger. You know, not just African-Americans, but all of us, because, you know, we all feel like at any moment, we can, we're gonna be the person saying, I can't breathe Mm -hmm. because of COVID. And we could like, so that word, that word, that sentence, like I can't breathe really resonated because we're afraid in the same way, you know, even though we're not, as afraid about having a police officer put his knee on our necks, but we're afraid. We know what that sense of vulnerability is like. Yes. So I think we could really relate to George Floyd in a way we've never been able to relate to these situations before where we could like other them and say, Oh, that's what happens to black men, but that's not going to happen to us. But, but in this case, we're like, Oh my God, we know what that's like. We have that fear of not being able to breathe. Right. right. And I'm mm-hmm. not one to, you know, have mm-hmm. that kind of feeling, but I know of friends who do mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, they're worried about having it happen to them. And, uh, you know, mm-hmm. um, I have nothing but sympathy and they have, yeah. uh, they have my support. Yeah. But I, what I'm saying is I think that for the first time, all of America or most mm-hmm. of America could understand that vulnerability that in the past they might have distanced themselves from, you know, and, and felt like they were George Floyd and felt like they, they can be behind this. And so that's why you saw protests, not just in cities, but in small towns and rural areas. You Around know? the world. Around the world, because it's like we all felt like George Floyd. But having said all that, like that happened in May, and now it's end of August. End of August. And we're still seeing protests, and it's become so politicized, right? Yes. It really has become um, polarizing, dividing, even though back in May it felt like it united us. 
now it feels like it's dividing us, you know, among people who want to, you know, really stand up for um, people who are being um, murdered by the police and people who ask, well, what is the best way to make that change? You know, and well, then, of course, we have the right wing just spewing just crazy talk, you know, just oh, my crazy God. Talk. Yes, I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm hearing it down here loud and clear. It's like mm -hmm. uh, on one side, you got, you know, the message of Black Lives Matter. I can't breathe, etc. The other supported by um, who knows what QAnon or whatever saying these guys are terrorists. They're trying to destroy America. And I'm here thinking, good God, that yeah. they're not understanding. They're not, they don't get it. The message, what happened to the message? Well, you know what? It, I think it's really classic gaslighting. You know, it's like what abusers do to the abused is to hurt them and to say, no, it's your fault that I'm hurting you, you know? Um, and yeah. that's what's really driving me crazy is like the victims are being told that it's your fault. It's your fault that the 17 year old started shooting you and killed you. It's, you know, it's, it's like, it's that's gaslighting. That's when you feel like you're going crazy. Yes. And, and, the, and the fact that so many people seem to buy into this idea that the 17 year old somehow is the hero and not a cold-blooded murderer that shot people who were protesting peacefully. So, I mean, I, you know, I'm just, I'm just really, I, I can't sleep at nights. I mean, there are times like after that Kenosha shooting, I couldn't sleep at night. I'm with you. I'm yeah, with you. It's, it's painful, but John, you know this. We got to figure it out. We got to figure out how we can talk to people, even though it seems impossible. Because well, if we don't do it, it's going to get worse. Um, remember that one glorious time. Um, I, I say glorious, but we were in a, a financial crisis back in two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Back in those glorious days when we had uh, the Main Street Republicans and the Blue Dog Democrats. Somehow, those two groups were in the middle. They're actually talking, trying to figure stuff out. Uh, sadly, those days are gone, but it's, it's like, to me, that was a glorious moment where we were closer to the center ever than before, trying to figure out how you know, to come across the crisis at that time. And now it feels like we're, uh, you know, politically, it feels like they're so far apart that no one's talking. I feel, you know, like I'm, I'm in the middle there myself. And I know there might be other people in the middle who just haven't spoken out yet. Maybe that's what we need to reach, reach out to because it's like, um, you know, the one on one side saying, you know, er, how dare you? And the other one is doing the same thing uh, um, because somehow mm -hmm. hate is speaking louder than love. Mm -hmm. Okay, so because I think people find it empowering when yeah. you have somebody who is good at trolling someone and you're owning them and um, whatever you do, you, it's like you slam people, um, then people feel empowered by that. Yes. You know? Yes. And, and they think it's like a sport. Like, it's like, oh, you know, here's a scoreboard. So Trump is ahead because he didn't say these things today. Yeah, you know, and and I, I mean, as you know, I'm not big on treating democracy like a sports game, um, <laughs> where we have like winners and losers, and it's about uh, a competition. Um, what I want to see is people problem solving together. Yeah, and I want to get to the place where where like this is not a game. This is not about who wins and loses. It's really about us governing, problem solving, working yep. together, right? And I've seen it happen locally. I've seen it. There are times when it, it has happened. And somehow, I know it sounds crazy. 
I feel like we have to get back to doing that or ask people to do it. And 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 the only thing, only way I know how to do it is just by creating opportunities for people to do it and inviting them. I, I think um, the one last glimpse we had of that uh, was when, when was it? It was during the 2008, I think it was the 2008 uh, election during a crisis when John McCain, rest his soul, good man, had asked Barack Obama uh, to see if, you know, they can work together to solve this problem. This was during an election year, right? Mm -hmm. And since then, we had not seen uh, this, you know, opposing sides ask, or, you know, being in conference together to help solve the problem. It's like, no, we're gonna we're gonna do this because it's all your fault, um, mm-hmm. which is another one of those empowering things. It's it's like perhaps we just need leaders on both sides to say, can we just put this aside? We got a heck of a crisis here that we need to solve, and we need your help. I think. Well, that's, you know what? Hmm. I mean, I agree with everything you're saying except for one thing. Sure. We cannot get leaders on either side to do that right now. No. Okay. So that's why I feel like we have to do it from the bottom up. Also Things agree. have to change from bottom up. You know, they're going to have to take the lead from us because they're locked into that football game or wrestling match. Right. And they can't just take themselves out of the ring. Right. Yeah. Agreed. So they, they're stuck inside the ring and so people like us i think have to take on leadership to really say you know what i don't want to play that game i'm going to do something else right yes you know and and so you know one thing i want to say is like every time i bring the subject up of how do we talk to other people how do we talk across differences how do we talk to um people who are in altered reality um Everyone, most majority of the comments, and I'm seeing it right now on my on this thread, is just you can't talk to those people. Okay, you can't talk to them. They're racist. They're brainwashed. We have to start somewhere. We got to start somewhere. Yeah, I abs- I mean, look, I know it's difficult. Okay, mm. I and it wears me out, and I understand why people say that. I'm right? with you. I'm with you. Yeah, but there, uh, people, the way people approach it is by somehow pe- telling them or talking down to them or this, having the subtext be, you're an idiot, you're a racist. If you start a conversation by telling people they're stupid and racist, they're not going to listen to you. <laughs> well, um, I, actually, I could tell you something that's literally close to home. I have uh-huh. um, a neighbor who ran for city council on a on mm-hmm. Republican ticket Great man, loved his family and and uh, and so forth. Uh, great neighbor. He helped me out a number of times, mm-hmm. but because he was on a Republican ticket, everybody was just calling him a racist. Mm-hmm. Everyone, and I think he felt heartbroken about that. In fact, he moved out of the neighborhood, and I was like, "He's a human being. He's a human being. Just because he ran on a pub uh, on a Republican ticket." does not automatically make him a racist, mm. for goodness sakes. Um, so I, I think maybe that needs to be the starting point of get all these labels out of our heads, start with the person first. If he's overly mm. racist, fine. But uh, until then, let him prove himself to be a human being first. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I just want to just point out to people, you know, think of the, think of the teacher you had that was most effective at teaching you. Okay. Think of the qualities of that teacher. Did this teacher make you feel stupid? Did this teacher talk down to you? condescend to you right Mm. no not at all the best teachers the most effective ones are patient 
and give you a chance to learn, give you the benefit of the doubt. Right? Oh, yes. Yeah, and talk to you in a way that you understand. Yes. So they don't just talk like they just came out of a graduate seminar. They talk to you like if you're in se you're seven years old, appropriate for a seven year old. Like they they know how to talk to people in that knowing knowing that audience. And so so that's what I want to I want people to think about when you talk to um, people around you who seem to be in that alter reality mm -hmm. is to like channel your favorite teacher. In other words, do not be patronizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Do not be patronizing. That's the exactly. Word. Exactly. Don't be patronizing. It doesn't work. It's going and to be hard. It's going to be hard. It, it really will be. You have to turn that part of your brain off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, look, I can't say I succeed every time, but I've ha been Me able neither. to have extraordinary connections with people who are very different, you know, people who frustrate me or people who seem really out there. And once you start a relationship where it feels mutual and respectful and they feel like you see them as a human being and care about them as a human being, mm -hmm. like the possibilities expand exponentially. They just become more receptive. They, they're, they're not guarding themselves against attacks from you, but they become more receptive to hearing what you have to say. But it does take patience and it does take listening to them. Even if you want to just stop them and say, no, I, I, that's stupid and that's garbage and that's just conspiracy theories. I think, I think you know, we got to get used to saying, yeah, I wonder why you think that what are you know where do, where did you get that information what are the sources for that and just like ask people questions as you as as i said we talked about the other day i mean you know socrates is definitely my favorite um historical figure mm -hmm. because what socrates did was he asked people really good questions and led them to start thinking more critically and rationally, right? If I can support that, um, I, I go to uh, Seacoast and um, our pastor, Pastor Surat, gave us a retelling of the Good Samaritan. I wonder if I could just uh, share that with you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I'll, I'm gonna paraphrase it here, but uh, imagine if, uh, like, say, a, a Seacoast churchgoer walks down the street on Broad Street, gets beaten up by a gang of whatever, uh, is on the street and let alone dying. So um, here comes a, a church pastor, walks across or walks by this poor man, feels pity, and walks away. Then next comes a, a, a small business owner feels pity, walks away. And then along comes, let's say, uh, oh, give me a moment here. Along comes Joe Biden, uh, takes the poor man over to St. Roper Francis Hospital, uh, gives him uh, like uh, um, 100,000 and says, take care of this man, give him clothes, give him medicine and so forth. And uh, any additional bills he has, let me know and I'll pay them off. Now, that would be something that he would tell to his, um, uh, that he, uh, our pastor said in, in church. And he quickly followed that up with, boy, it really got uncomfortable here pretty quickly, didn't it? Just because, you know, Charleston can be a conservative uh, pl uh, city, right? And he says, now, if I were to tell that to my, uh, my friends, he would uh, liberal friends, excuse me, he would use Mitch McConnell or, you know, and so the question would be at the end of his story, who did right? Who did the right thing? And, uh, you know, so if you're telling a story to your liberal friends, use Mitch McConnell, 
they have to be the ones to say or struggle to say Mitch McConnell did good. Or if you're telling it to conservative friends, they would have to struggle to say Joe Biden did good. Do you see where, do you see where that's coming at? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. So what do you take away from that? I take away from that that politics can be a very powerful thing when you're uh, when you're trying to explain who did good in an awful awful situation. If you let politics get in the way, you may not see uh, the good that person can do. If if I you know, um, say if you're a heart surgeon and, and you save the you know lives of some people and you find out that he's a Trump voter. What are you going to think of him? Are you going to think of him as a heart surgeon or are you going to think of him as a Trump voter? Mm -hmm. So are you saying that your takeaway is that there are many dimensions to people? As there should be. Mm -hmm. It's it's like politics is one thing, but don't forget, um, you know, we're put on God's, God's earth to do whatever it is that we chose to do, whether it's, you know, being a heart surgeon or a teacher or a garbage man or a chef or just a mother or, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. don't let politics be the single defining factor of another person. Mm -hmm. Because the person who can save your life may vote for Mm -hmm. someone who you don't vote for. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen then? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the way I would put it is, I think if we lose our sense of connection to one another Mm -hmm. as human beings, where I start seeing you not as a human being, but my enemy. Yes. Right. Then it's almost like we are rupturing the very thing that can really keep us a peaceful, stable, prosperous nation or community. If we don't, if we lose that connection. So even if we disagree, it's important for us to feel that sense of connection to one another, call it humanity, what what you will, but but I think think we've got to maintain that connection or to me, we're on a slippery, slippery slope to civil war it's, and the, the worst kind of violence. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. Uh, agreed. It's like, do not let the way you vote uh, become, define the person that, uh, that you are. Mm-hmm. Um, what I mean is, if a friend of mine votes for Donald Trump, and I know that some of them will, Mm -hmm. does that mean I'm no longer friends with them or do I see them as enemies? The Christian Mm -hmm. part of me is saying, don't be ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or put another way, uh, suppose Jesus were to come back today, Mm -hmm. would we recognize him? (laughs) Probably not. Um, I don't think so. Um, we have reduced each other to caricatures. It's almost like we can't um, see each other. Like we need some sort of a visual correction because we have we just reduce everyone, flatten people into these quick identifiers like progressive, conservative, Republican, Democrat, racist. Um, whatever. And, and that's a, it's, it's, it's really hurting our souls. It's hurting us at the deepest level to have it done to us and to do it to other people. Yeah. It's hurting all of us. Like no one really benefits from that. You know, Um, I, um, I really want to find a way to show people what kind of transformations could take place in within ourselves and, and other people in our communities, in our country, if we were able to stop seeing each other as adversaries and to stop being so driven 
by the desire to win and to beat them, to see ourselves in this kind of zero sum game competition, right? Yes. Um, and I know that it's partly just the response to our institutions. We have a winner take all political system. You know, a co you know, capitalism is a very competitive economic system. So it's not just like we're just we chose to be this way. I mean, that's it just kind of we've become socialized into being very competitive when really um, I think our human nature is meant to be cooperative. We're supposed to live in cooperation, but we are denying ourselves that to live in a very competitive society. And part of us is dying. Part of us is dead as a result of that. That's my my take on things. I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, that's just based on... I think I agree yeah. with you. Well, but you know what? I mean, it's not unfortunate because it also means that there's a way out of this. Because there's a way out of this. The way out of this is to really start seeing how much we could benefit from cooperating. How much can we cooperate? How much do we gain from putting down the weapons, you know, and really being able to just connect with each other, focus on connecting with each other at, at the human level, and then see like what, what is possible based on that relationship. I'm hearing renaissance. Are we heading for another renaissance period possibly? Not at the rate we're going, but if we no. can make changes, um, maybe we can. What I'm saying is, you know, we there's so much talk about hatred, right? Mm -hmm. We're consumed by culture of hatred. We're consumed by uh, people just setting out to beat one another, humiliate each other. But there is a treasure trove of science, research, literature on love. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. It's not... A delusional thing. I mean, it's a very real thing. It's as real as as hatred. You know, and part of what thing what we need to do is learn how to do that because we don't know how to do it. So easy to hate, but it's 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 harder to love. And I, I think that I think needs to be the starting point right there. It's gonna be hard to do, but we gotta do it. And I think people, when I say something like that, the reaction is often like, my God, that's like so, such wishful thinking. That's so naive. Okay. But <laughs> I mean, listen, we all have benefited from love at some point in our lives, whether we got it from parents, extended family, friends, teachers. Sure. We all know how powerful it is right yes and and so okay so why do we deny ourselves the chance to be in loving relationships and to use that knowledge of how to love and be loved you know so that we can heal our country and create something that is an alternative to the mess we're in as you say start from the ground up um, yeah, city councils, um, uh, state elections, so forth. Start somewhere. Got to start from the bottom. Get that nice firm, you know, base started. As such, mm -hmm. you know, build up, uh, you know, nice, uh, loving city councils. Um, uh, while we're at it, uh, you know, talking about the police. Well, why not support better policemen? You know, mm -hmm. we don't have to. Don't talk about be fun the place yeah. let's talk about uh how can we make it better how can we make that better so i for, mean build it up yeah i mean here's here's the way i would want to position this i mean i think there are real solutions mm -hmm. okay i personally think we do need to redistribute funds from our common budget Agreed. Right? At least so, i think 
don't yeah, need I think we're control. over we're overfunding the military and we're overfunding law enforcement, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. OK, yep. so it's not like I don't think there are real solutions, but I'm talking about not being trapped in the in the ring where we're just made to punch each other. You're just and to get get out of that ring, you know, and to start basically saying, OK, we got to start building together. Let's raise the roof together. Let's build our city together. Let's build houses together and, and approach it from that standpoint of like, how do we make and build things? Because mm -hmm. right now, the name of the game is beat each other up. It's, it's like um, I was saying before, it's like, when did we become a police state? Mm -hmm. How did this happen? How do we get here? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but it, it is that very, to me, um, deadening, toxic energy, you know, that is about just domination and winning as opposed to um, nurturing and caring and creating. It's like they're two like different energies and two different paradigms, right? Yeah. I am not interested in dominating. I'm not interested in humiliating. <laughs> Those things are not in me. And that's what is happening every single day and being passed off as political discourse. People look at Twitter. It's all about humiliation. Okay. It's easy. I, I can't do it. It's I can't do it. Right. I'm not interested. I don't want to spend my life like trying to figure out how to humiliate anybody. You know, I want to spend my time figuring out like how to build together, how to create together, how to problem solve together and how to live like in a loving, harmonious, peaceful way so that we all feel like we're living our best lives and we all feel joy and love. I mean, I get, why, why is that so hard? I mean, I'm so, I'm so frustrated with this. I understand. It's okay. Sometimes you just yeah. need to let that out. I, I mean, yeah, I mean frustration, it's, an, it's a human emotion. You've got to let that out. Right. You know, um, someone, Eric, um, Eric Ram is asking, how am I supposed to love people, you know, who want to, who want to keep semi-automatic weapons and carry mace and all that. Okay. Yeah. So Eric, Eric. Okay. I am not saying you have to engage every single person who comes your way or people who are right now out to harm you. Okay. People who are abusing you. I want, I'm voting for Joe Biden. I want to get rid of the monster in the white house, the man who's being abusive. You know, I, I, I want to do that. So I'm not saying you got to engage every single one of those people. No, right? I, in fact, uh, yeah. I had to um, stop talking to a few people just because it got so toxic and, and, and I didn't know how to deal with any of it. So it's like, if I, didn't, mm -hmm. if I knew I was not going to have to say anything nice, it's best to just uh, put them on that Facebook 30 day mute and, and right. just not worry about it for a while. Just right. balance myself. Yeah. So Eric, so what I'm saying to you is I'm not asking you to love that person and engage that person and every single person who's out to harm you or hurt you. Okay, I'm talking about being able to at least have that minimum capacity to see their humanity despite the fact that they're doing something that you think is harmful or wrong. Okay, so that you don't sever that connection between you and that person. So at that very moment, when you see him holding an assault rifle, yeah, I think you need to move away, get away. But Agreed. it could be that if you stay connected just mentally, like not see them as, um, as a dehumanized other and opponent, you might be able to connect with them. Maybe two weeks from now, you run into him at the grocery store. Two weeks from now, you find out your cousin is dating this person. Like you don't know, you know. And I'm just saying, you know, if you're able to remain 
able to see the humanity of this person, even though they're doing something that you don't agree with, you might be able to change that person. But not at that moment. At that moment, you need to love yourself and get out of the way and move away and go to a safe place. It, it only makes sense, doesn't it? It's like if, if you're in harm's way, get out of harm's way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, it's, I'm not saying like you should be like Christ and just be go out into the middle of people shooting and try to stop it and hug them. I'm not saying that at all. Um, I, but, you know, but to see them as completely devoid of any humanity or worth and see them and, and, and wanting to hurt them, harm them and, and humiliate them, that's where I would like for us not to go. Um, I, I swear there's something in the Bible about this too. So, um, it's, it's like uh, it, it, it would be very easy for us at this point to turn away from spirituality, to turn our backs on God. But you can't do that either. I mean, because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's the very thing that uh, that they're accusing us of is, is, is accusing us of is, is being godless. Mm -hmm. And it's like. Mm -hmm. Nope. Sorry, pal. I'm voting for Biden. I'm on the left. I go to church mm -hmm. every Sunday. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So uh, another comment. Okay. So yeah, Peter, it's not possible to have a conversation with Trumpers. Um, okay. So what John and I are saying, what we, John and I agree on is a person, yes, can be voting for Trump or supporting Trump right now. And that, to me, I, I you know, <laughs> it, it is something I totally disagree with. But to reduce them to the word Trumper, to think that's the sum of all their entire existence and humanity, okay, that reductiveness is part of the problem. Because I, this person I, is many things. Mm. I have, um, on, on the top of my head, I can think of four or five people that I, I uh, involve myself with in, um, with, with, okay, so I, I do ballroom dance, I do salsa, I, so there's like a whole spectrum of people. So I know of four or five different uh, uh, Trump supporters who I'm close with. And uh, it would be wrong for me to say, okay, you're a Trump supporter, you're no longer my friend. How does that help? How does that help? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that this is what I believe. I believe that people change. They do change. They're not one thing rest of their lives. People change. I've changed. I'm sure you have too, John. Absolutely have changed. I, I went from, yeah. um, you know, uh, an NDP supporter in Canada, which is kind of like um, hard to describe. But anyway, uh, to, um, you know, to a Green Party supporter, to an Obama supporter, to. Yeah, but what? I meant more personally. Yeah. I meant more personally. More People personally, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And one of the things that I really love about American culture is that, and as an immigrant, having been born in another country and, and, and come here, um, the thing that I loved about America was our chance to start over. You know, we moved from South Korea to United States and we started over as a family. And we can start over, we can have we can have a rebirth. We can have a kind of, you know, citizenship in which we feel completely born again. You know, not, not, I don't mean in a religious way, just like we can, we do our lives. We can start again. And, and that's what is so beautiful about America to me. And our culture is that people do it all the time. You know, we, we like reconstitute. Go ahead. That sounds like the opposite of cancel culture, where it's like you do one wrong thing, one wrong mm -hmm. thing uh, in, in your past, 
you're out. And yeah. this to me sounds like the opposite of that, of, uh, you know what? People can change. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and so, beautiful thing. Exactly. That's exactly right. Um, so, Eric, um, you're asking, have you watched Trump rallies? Okay. Eric, not only have I watched Trump rallies, I have been to a bunch of Trump rallies. And I have live streams from Trump rallies. I have interviews from Trump rallies. Yes, I am very familiar with what happens at a Trump rally. And yes, it, I have. there are times when I've been at a Trump rally and scared like really scared, like, am I at a KKK rally? Scared. Um, but I have found that when I take, I thought if I'm able to have conversations with people outside of that adrenaline rushed collective experience and just sit down and with people one-on-one, you take them out of that, then I'm able to really connect with people. When they're at a rally, yeah, it's almost like everyone is high. They're like on drugs or something. So yeah, they they just kind of become another person. But again, they're not the way they are at a Trump rally every minute of their lives. So when you can get them to a quiet place and you can connect with them and look at them and talk to them one-on-one, I've been able to have amazing connections and conversations that led to, okay, And I I can show you guys videos where this, you can watch this happen that have led to people actually changing their minds. It does happen. That's, that is important. That's good. Yeah. And so I, I just, I'm just saying, don't be so quick to throw them out and decide that they're hopeless. You're not God. You don't know who's going to change, who's capable of changing. You don't know. Yeah. No one's him. Yeah. Yeah. And so all all I'm saying is let's give people a chance. You don't have to do it every single time, every single person. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if we give people a chance and not sever our connection with them as a human being, there are possibilities that open up in the future. And that's all I'm saying is like, can we give each other a chance? And um, anyway, I, I feel like I've been preaching. Um, <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. It, uh, to me, I'm hearing, keep reaching out, keep reaching, do not isolate, do not isolate anybody and say, mm-hmm. they're canceled out of, out of my life. I don't want to talk to you anymore. Mm-hmm. That's a mistake. Keep reaching yeah. out. Exactly. I think, you know, I, I do want to add one more caveat to that, which is it's very important that we love ourselves and take care of ourselves. So this is not a, a call for people to just throw themselves into the lion's den and hope for the best. You know, I think we got to do this in a way where we feel safe and cared for. Um, so and uh, the way I think we do that is to talk to people in quiet ways, one on one, and really make politics less about a game and more about two people thinking together. Yeah. Um, so why don't we do this, John? It was lovely, lovely talking to you. We should talk exactly. again. And um, I'm very grateful that you gave me time today <laughs> to, and twice today because you came to an organizing call. Um, Count Me Into Win is an effort that um, my friends and I have put together to like help people, help other people vote. So reach out, reaching out to their friends and family and helping people develop a plan to vote and giving resources so that we can be as, like, as effective as we can be. Voter information and helping with disinformation that's out there, like all of that. Um, and it's really lovely community of people who are also giving each other a lot of emotional support because as you know, John, it's very difficult right now to talk about politics and it can be draining. Yeah. So I hope you're taking care of yourself. I am. <laughs> you have a lovely dog there. 
Arlo. What's your doggy's uh, name? His name is Arlo. I named him after oh. the uh, the musician Arlo Guthrie. Oh, I love Guthrie. And Arlo I had Guthrie. a black and white one. I named him Woody after mm -hmm. Woody Guthrie. Oh. I, I think I, I think uh, uh, folk musicians have the best names. If I were to have a girl dog, I'd probably name her uh, um, Joni. <laughs> I love that. Well, um, well, I'm glad that you have a dog with you. I have a dog as well named Beto. He's uh, named after Beto Vork because um, I met Beto when I was uh, volunteering for Beto Vork. Um, cool. And yeah, he's uh, been a lifesaver. I want to show off my new T-shirt that please, my uh, design, my design team, very talented design team made. It says, "Joe gets my vote. He's a mensch. A mensch is Yiddish word for a very decent, honorable person. Um, and you guys can get this if you go to his he's a mensch dot com, and it's organic. It's organic cotton." Uh, it feels really good. I just wore it, and it's so nice. <laughs> and you can get different colors, and I, I feel so happy wearing this because it's, like, so soft. Um, so I'm going to wear it all the time. Um, so thanks, everybody, for joining. Find me at countmewintowin.org. The 100 Voters Project is our effort to get the vote out. And um, go to he's, he's a mensch com and order some merchandising that really helps explain i think what this election is about like we have a decent person with compassionate who trying to save our country and then we have somebody who really doesn't have a skill set to be a leader and who is trying to win this election by creating a civil war um and i, I just there's no no comparison <laughs> but um, thank you all and I, I will be back again with another conversation and have a really really good weekend John thank you very much and you do as well okay okay, okay you too God take bless care you. of yourself okay. you've been listening to conversations about a way forward from count me in to win and the talk on main street to learn more find us on facebook at the talk on main street <laughs>